Hey guys, um, this is the lecture for chapter 34 is going to be divided in half. Um, just because it is a very long chapter, we're, this is the first part of the chapter. The next part will be online to, for you guys on Thursday, and then we'll do this test on Friday. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have heard or not, but you all do get spring break next week, so you will not be getting any assignments or tests from us. So that's the reason why I'd like to just go ahead and take this test on Friday. Um, and I hope you all are doing well. Okay, this one is nursing care of patients with lower GI disorders. Go ahead and flip through those, Kate. Okay, the first part is just a review of anatomy. It's the small intestine, which you guys know, my little, the, my little mnemonic is DJI, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. The large intestine, which is the ascending, transverse and descending rectum and then your anus. Kate, it's not funny. Uh, just to review, um, when we talked about, I'm sorry, just to review and talking about pain. Remember if you have pain in your light, low, right lower quadrant, that was what Kate? Pain proof. Never mind, don't <laughs> listen to her. Pain in the right lower quadrant is the appendix. Right upper quadrant is the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. I'm going to have to find me a new van of white, I believe. Left upper quadrant is gas. Left lower quadrant is usually diverticulitis. And the new one I'm going to throw at you is epigastric, which is like right in the middle of your stomach, or the abdominal cavity. And this is usually due to peptic ulcer disease or pancreatitis. Now I'm going to go over those again. It's a review of pain. Um, right lower quadrant is usually appendicitis. Right upper quadrant is usually liver, gallbladder, or pancreas. Left upper quadrant is usually gas pain, or it can be spleen, but most of the time it is gas. Left lower quadrant is usually diverticulitis. And then the new one is epigastric, and that's usually peptic ulcer disease or pancreatitis. The first disorder we're going to talk about is constipation. And this is when stool is held in the rectal cavity for a period of time that's unusual for the patient or for less than, or the patient is having less than three bowel movements in a week. Um, some folks, like I have personal family members that literally only go twice a month and that's what's normal for them. Um, there's some folks who go every day, every two days. But the normal is supposed to be three times a week. So what happens is when the stool is held, um, there water is absorbed. We uh, wa more water is absorbed, which makes the stool hard and dry, and it causes it to be really painful and hard to pass. Um, there is um, a new term for you. <clears throat> it's called laxation, and that's L-A-X-A-T-I-O-N. And that's the urge to have a bowel movement. That's where the word laxative comes from because it increases your urge to have a bowel movement. And one, the person repeatedly um, ignores the need to go to the bathroom, like some people I know, Katen, <laughs> refuses to go for whatever reason. Then they can develop what's called obstipation, which is prolonged constipation. And these folks really have a hard time. And some of the causes, can be medications such as narcotics. It can be um, hemorrhoids and fissures. And how that plays a part is because it hurts. When they go to bear down to have a bowel movement, they're in pain, so they just don't have a bowel movement. Uh, low intake of fiber and fluids. And when we were talking about medications, we mentioned, or you guys know of narcotics, but also like Xan Xanax and um, Ativan, some of those medications can cause it too. Uh, some of the signs and symptoms, um, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the signs and symptoms are abdominal pain, the abdominal distension, indigestion, intestinal rumbling, and that is where, you, you know, you literally can hear their belly grumbling. They'll feel rectal pressure, and sometimes they'll have incomplete emptying. They'll go and they'll, they'll poop for just a little bit and jump up and say, okay, I'm done, and they're not through, and then that stool stays there. They'll develop hard stools, sometimes headache and fatigue, decreased appetite, and talking about straining. Um, there are people, 
irritating. There are some people who will trigger or do the Vasalva maneuver, which will stimulate vasovagal, and and they literally can pass out. Uh, I don't know what's so funny. I'm sorry. Well, I do, but anyway. Um, they can literally pass out uh, while having a bowel movement. And actually, it's been proven that a lot of folks will actually have an MI while they're on the toilet. Um, that's one of the things we saw when I worked um, night shift is that um, early morning, you hated to see your patients get up between 5 and 6 to go to the bathroom because they'd be in the bathroom trying to strain to have a bowel movement end up with an MI. Um, another word that, um, I think it was, okay, an impaction is the other word I want you to be familiar with. And that's what just simply that you have a ball of stool that has dried and it's too hard to pass. I may have forgot to mention that. So again, those are the signs and symptoms. Go ahead, Vanna. Um, di oops, com uh, complications, impaction, which I just talked about. Ulcer straining megacolon. And megacolon is simply where they hold so much stool in the lower part of their colon that it actually stretches and becomes extremely large. And they end up can, are able to hold a large amount of stool there. So when they do go have a bowel movement, that stool is actually too large for them to pass through their rectum. So that is megacolon. And most of the time, uh, constipation is self-diagnosed. You know, most people can tell you when they're constipated, especially as they get older. Um, history and physical with rectal exam. And what this is referring to is if you do a rectal exam, then you'll feel the hard stool actually in the uh, rectal vault. Um, the thing when um, I started working in the nursing home when I got out of LPN school, it was routine practice every three days. It actually was always three to 11 because it was always my shift. But every three days, we would do a fecal impaction check on every patient, even if they had a, had had a bowel movement. The reason is, is sometimes somebody will be constipated and this will be real hard, but they'll have like watery bowel movement or like, like diarrhea. And what that is, it's not true diarrhea and it's actually not a true bowel movement. What is happening is, is the stool above the impaction is seeping out around. So that used to be common practice is every three days we would do a, re a fecal impaction check and we would always give them, um, it was milk and magnesia and prune juice together and they would be warmed up and it came from the cafeteria in the nursing home <clears throat> and they would send it up. And those little folks used to love to get those milk and magnesia prune juice toddies. I don't know why, but they did. They used to love to get them. But that was what we had to do on 3 to 11 whenever I worked. Now they've gotten away from um, fecal impaction checks just because they are finding some folks will vagal down when that is being done. And that really should be at the discretion of the physician to perform. So you really have to go by the policies of the nursing home or a facility you work at. <clears throat> Therapeutic interventions, high fiber diet, two to three liters of fluid a day, a strengthened abdominal muscles, activity, bulk forming, bulk forming agents, stool softeners, and education. Education just simply is referring to making sure that your patients know that when they feel like they need to have a bowel movement, that they need to go and not just hold it. And there is truth in the fact that activity will um, help increase with bowel movements. We might want to stop at two minutes. It's nine minutes right now. What, and just do it in, divide it up? Yep. Okay. She's saying that for us to be able to load it here because of my internet, we're going to have to stop this part and then record another 10 minutes. So I will finish up with constipation and then we'll stop it and then we'll start it again. Um, data collection, definitely establish a rapport with your patient before you start talking to them about pee and poop because that is an embarrassing subject for everyone. And a lot of times they won't tell you when you go in. You have to be nonchalant, not giggle, and not be embarrassed yourself, but just simply ask when their last bowel movement was. Auscultate bowel sounds, and you guys have already done that. Inspect, inspect and palpate the abdomen. Okay. All right, we're going to stop right here, and then she'll record again.